Last year, I received a call from a gentleman called Jack, who said that he wanted help retiring as soon as he can. What had prompted the call is that, unfortunately, one of his best friends had passed away recently at the age of 60. He was in otherwise good health, so this was a really big shock to everyone. And what's more is that Jack's mate had been talking about retiring for years, about the things that he wanted to do and the places that he wanted to visit, and about finally getting to spend more time with his wife. But he kept kicking the can down the road because even though he had saved a lot for retirement, the uncertainty of the future meant that he never had the confidence to actually do it. And his death was like a bucket of cold water on Jack's head. He was 59 and had been planning on working until 65. But this made him realize just how precious time is and how he needs to start making the most of what he has left. Between Jack and his wife, Jess, across their pensions and ices, they had 500,000 pounds invested and they wanted my help to understand if he retired today, what type of lifestyle could they afford? He'd started to look into this himself, but like his friend, he'd ended up with so many questions going around and around in his head. What does a decent quality of life cost in retirement? And how is inflation going to affect those costs? Will my investments perform well enough to sustain that? You know, what if there's a stock market crash right after I retire? And how long will I live? If I die at 65, financially, problem solved. But what if I end up living to 90? Am I going to run out of money and end up being a burden on my family? These are the concerns that all retirees have. And the uncertainty of these often keeps people working for way longer than they need to. Or even when they do retire, they don't feel confident enough to actually spend the money that they've worked so hard for. So today, I'm going to show you the process that I went through with Jake and Jess and the methods that we used to address each of these concerns to help them to understand how much they could afford to spend and how even in the face of this uncertainty, we got them into a position where they felt confident retiring. Although we're going to be getting into a lot of detail about their personal financial situation, which is no doubt going to be different from yours, the principles and processes that I'm going to show you are relevant to all retirees, no matter if you've got £100,000 or millions. Many of you will be familiar with the first few basic steps. But in the final part of the video, we're going to get into more advanced financial planning techniques. So make sure you stick around for that. At the time, Jack was 59 and Jess was 58. They owned their home outright, having recently paid off their mortgage. Jack had £370,000 in defined contribution pensions. Jess had £80,000 in hers. And between them, they had £50,000 in stocks and shares ISAs. So overall, they had £500,000 invested. They also had £30,000 in cash, and they both expected to qualify for full state pensions. The first thing that I asked them was whether they'd done much thinking about how much they would like to be able to spend in retirement. But they said that given that Jack was not expecting to retire until 65, and all of this had happened so suddenly, they hadn't really given it that much thought. But ideally, they would like to be able to sustain the quality of life they have now. Jack's take-home pay was £4,000 per month, and from this, they typically ended up with a few hundred pounds left over. By their estimate, they were spending just over £45,000 per year. So their initial goal was that they wanted to be able to maintain that whilst adjusting for inflation throughout their retirement. Privately, I had a strong suspicion that they would actually end up spending less than this. But instead of correcting them at this stage, I wanted to take them on a bit of a journey and show them what this initial plan would look like. So I built it into our modeling software and uh, yeah, it didn't look good. This line represents how their liquid assets are projected to decumulate over the initial years of retirement. You can see how the trajectory starts off very steep, but slows down slightly as their state pensions kick in. To build this, we've assumed they invest in a portfolio of 60% global stocks and 40% bonds and made linear assumptions about the returns that that might produce and how inflation might affect their expenditure. But clearly in this situation, no matter what assumptions we use, it's not likely to look good. Drawing £45,000 per year from a £500,000 portfolio is the equivalent of a 9% withdrawal rate. However, because most of their assets are held in pensions, there will be some tax to pay on withdrawals, pushing the actual withdrawal rate up closer to 9.5%. And that rate gets higher and higher each year as the portfolio reduces in size, but the required drawdowns increase due to expenditure inflation. Initially, Jess and Jake were disappointed to see this, but then they quickly started to poke holes in the expenditure assumptions that we'd used, thinking about how their costs might actually change in retirement. The thing is, with this type of modeling, if you're not confident in the assumptions that you're putting into it, you're never going to be confident enough in the results to actually make any financial decisions off the back of it. So I asked them to go away and complete a detailed breakdown of their expenditure. 
I've tidied this up a bit, but this is broadly what it looked like. On household maintenance, food, clothing, and essential hygiene, they were spending £733 per month. Their energy and water bills had gone up a lot recently, so they were spending almost £700 a month on utilities. They owned their cars outright, but between petrol, tax, and insurance, they had car-related costs of £360 per month. They had other general expenses, but nothing particularly out of the ordinary for a family on their income. They spend £200 per month eating out and on entertainment, and £3,500 per year on holidays. All in all, it came to £3,766 per month, or just over £45,000 per year. Jess and Jack had never actually done a detailed budget like this before, but they found the process really enlightening because it gave them a new perspective on how they were allocating their money and whether that actually aligned with their values. And by the way, if you want to give this template a go yourself, down in the description, you will find a link to where you can download a copy. So with that in mind, I asked them, what are the things that you think would change in retirement? The first thing that would change is that they were currently spending 500 pounds a month supporting their daughter at university. But given that she was due to graduate later in the year, that would go. Given that they'd no longer be saving money, they'll stop contributing 150 pounds per month into their ISIS. When Jack retires, they thought that they would be spending less on clothing, but given that they'd be spending more time at home, their food bill would probably go up. No changes to utilities, but they anticipated some big reductions in car costs. They'd previously been running two cars, but given that Jack will no longer need to commute and they live in a town, they could manage on one, which also meant that they no longer need a parking permit bringing their overall car costs down by £150 per month. He'll also no longer be buying lunches whilst at work. But given the recent death of their friend, they wanted to focus on keeping fit and making the most of their remaining healthy years by traveling as much as they can and doing the activities that they love. So they wanted a much bigger budget to do these things. All in all, with these changes, their expenditure is now coming in at £3,354 per month, just over £40,000 per year and 5 k less than before. Now, it's also likely that as they get older and start to slow down, their expenditure will drop even further. Given that that's so far out, instead of doing a detailed estimate of what that might look like, we assumed their expenditure would drop by 25% once Jack turns 75. And based on these new assumptions, their assets are now projected to last all the way up to 95 years old. Jess and Jack were quite surprised by this because they'd only reduced their expenditure by a little over 10%, but yet now their assets are projected to last 20 years longer which demonstrates the dramatic effect that small changes can have over long periods of time. £5,000 per year doesn't sound like a lot of money, but over 40 years, it adds up to a hell of a lot. The reason we do these projections is to give us a new perspective from which to make better financial decisions. But to have confidence in the model, you need to be confident in the assumptions that it's based on. Jack and Jess could now see why it's so important that they have a detailed understanding of their expenditure and what an extra £1,000 here or there means to their quality of life. But Jack still had some questions. What happens if our investment returns end up being lower than what we've projected, or if inflation ends up being higher? These are really good questions, and we'll address them shortly. But before we do, there's a more pressing concern. If you were born in 1930, you would have had a life expectancy of just 58 years old. Back then, retirement was something that few people expected. And even if they did, it was often short-lived. Whereas a baby born today has an average life expectancy of 80 years old, which means that they have a high chance of spending 20 or even 30 years in retirement. Retirement is a relatively modern phenomenon that certainly has a lot of benefits, but the downside of our longevity is that it now makes retirement so much harder to plan for. Not only because we have no idea whether we'll live for four years or 40 years, but also because there is a high chance that we will need some sort of care or assisted living towards the end of our lives. Roughly 25% of people require care at some point in their lives, with it lasting three years on average. So between Jess and Jack, there is a high chance that at least one of them is going to need care. And depending on where you live, this can cost anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000 pounds per year. And for Jess and Jack, that would wipe them out very quickly. When I first bring this up with clients, they often just laugh it off, saying that they would never let it get to that point and that they would just wheel themselves off to Switzerland. But I can tell you that it's highly likely that your future self will wish that you took this stuff more seriously. Even if you think that you don't care about yourself, if you don't have a plan in place for this stuff, that burden is going to fall on your children, whether you like it or not. Most people don't appreciate how emotionally and financially stressful putting a family member into care can be. So if you have actually been through this yourself, 
I would really appreciate it if you could leave a comment down below with your story to help others recognize how important it is to plan for this stuff. I discussed this at length with Jess and Jack. We workshop what they might do if either one of them needed care, how their lives would change, and most importantly, how they would expect to fund it, whether that be through downsizing their home, equity release, or selling it completely. What's not built into our plan is that they were expecting to receive an inheritance at some point from Jess's parents. So between this and the potential for them to release equity from their home, we had a plan and that helped them to feel comfortable that we had this covered. Now to get back to Jack's questions, to create this model, we have had to make linear assumptions about future investment returns and inflation. But in reality, both of these are unknown. They certainly won't be constant and they're likely to be very volatile. Up until you get to retirement, linear modeling like this using sensible assumptions is all you really need. It helps you to clearly identify the key events of your plan and gives you a direction of travel. But when you get to the point of retiring, to be confident making these big decisions, we need something more robust. So we use software to stress test that plan using over 100 years of historical stock market and inflation data to see how it would have held up under different conditions. Of the 792 scenarios we tested, this plan would have been sustainable in 82% of them, whereas in 18%, they would have run out of money. Now, I normally don't show clients this level of detail because it can be a bit overwhelming, but what I wanted to show you is what sits behind this so you can appreciate just how variable those results are. Each line here represents a different scenario. In the worst case scenario, they would have run out of money by just 66, whereas in the best case, they're ending up with millions of pounds left over. This demonstrates just how variable investment returns and inflation can be. You could have got lucky and retired at a point after which you'd seen a good sequence of returns and never had to worry about money or you could be unlucky with a stock market crash or high inflation coming right after you retire. We have no idea what is going to happen. And it's this uncertainty that people really struggle with. I reminded Jack and Jess that with this, we are looking back into the past. The future could look very different, but with a one in five historical chance of failure, this was not filling Jack with a lot of confidence. So I said, look, you got two options. Either you spend less or keep working until you feel confident you have enough that you'll never have to worry about money. But then there's a high chance either you'll die before you get the chance to enjoy it, or you'll end up in your 80s with millions of pounds, which is a big waste when you could have been spending more when you were younger and able to enjoy it. Or you can accept that the future will always be uncertain and you can't do anything about that. And instead, focus on how you can adapt if you do get unlucky. As you can see here, in the majority of scenarios that fail, it becomes pretty clear that something is amiss within the first five or 10 years of retirement. So there will be warning signs. And if we see them, we adapt. And the great thing about Jess and Jack's situation is that almost half of their expenditure is on non-essential discretionary items. So by helping them recognize that they actually have a lot of headroom to reduce expenditure and still be able to live a good quality of life, it helped them to realize how resilient they can be. But there's also another dimension that we're missing. This plan was successful in 82% of historical scenarios, but that's based on either Jack or Jess living to 100 years old. This graph demonstrates that the longer that they live for, the higher their chances of running out of money. If at least one of them lives to 80, there's an 11% chance that they'll need to adapt. If they live to 90, a 15% chance, but above 100, the chances of running out of money increase dramatically. But what are their chances of actually living that long? Well, that's what we're looking at here. Based on ONS statistics, this shows us the probability that at least one of them will still be alive at these points. There's a 93% chance that at least one of them will get to 80, a 64% chance that they'll get to 90, a 9% chance that it'll make it to 100. So at 100, yes, there is an 18% chance of running out of money, but there's only a small chance of them actually living that long. So we can combine these two statistics together to give us a longevity adjusted success rate. Or another way to put this is what is the risk of running out of money and still being alive, which as you can see, doesn't drop below 10% at any point. Again, it's really important to remember that here we're looking at historical data. The future could look very different, but by giving Jack and Jess this perspective, they're now in a position where they know how much they want to spend in retirement. They're confident that this is likely to be sustainable. They recognize that there's no guarantee, but if they do get unlucky, they're prepared to adapt and they know that they have the capacity to do so. And from this perspective, it was easy for them to decide that the opportunity of retirement was well worth the risks. 
the opportunity to stop working, to start spending the time doing the things that they love with the people that they love and just being grateful for the opportunity that their friend never had. If you found this case study interesting, you should check out this video here where I show you another case study of a couple who were trying to escape the rat race and how we help them to find a new, more sustainable way to live on their own terms. I'll see you there.